Last week, we looked at the first four Beatitudes. Uh, together, they emphasize our weakness and needs before God. The poor in spirit are those who confess their need for God. The mourners are those who grieve over sin. The meek are those who humbly submit to God. And finally, those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those who long for God's will and His way. Today, we move on to the second set of Beatitudes. And you will notice a shift in emphasis and different writers describe in different ways. Some say it as a transition from passive to active Beatitudes. Some view describes it as moving from God's dependence to his outworking. And some describes it as the Beatitudes of needs to the Beatitudes of actions. Still, some people will frame them as disciples' vertical relationship to God and horizontal relationship with others. John Stott, he described it as change from our attitude towards God to our attitude towards people. Now, these are all helpful ways to describe this shift in emphasis. Now, what is important here that we need to remember is that even though there is a change in emphasis, we need to remember that Jesus is still speaking to the same group of people and about the same group of people, and that is describing believers. And all eight Beatitudes together, they paint a, a very beautiful portrait of the disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's begin with the fifth Beatitudes. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Verse 7. It has been said, justice is God giving us what we deserve. Mercy is God not giving us what we deserve. And grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Church, we know we are all sinners and born in sin. We all deserve to be eternally separated from God and His holiness. We deserve to die eternally. But it is of the Lord's mercy that today you and I are here. It is of the Lord's mercy that we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. Lamentations 3, verse 22. Whenever someone sins against you or behaves so, so badly, sometimes in our heart how we feel. We didn't say that, but in our heart. I don't want to go on. I think you know. Now, this Beatitude's meaning is pretty obvious. All mercy comes from God. All mercy comes from God, and He calls us to be merciful as He is. Remember, Jesus told a parable about a rich man who forgave his servant a huge debt. But then that servant, he turned around and wouldn't forgive another one for a much smaller debt. And when the rich man heard what his servant had done, what did he say to the servant? He said to him, shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? Matthew 18, verse 33. We call this the parable of the unmerciful servant. 
a merciful servant. Why? Because the servant was not willing to forgive the other person. Peter, in his first letter to the church, he reminded us, brothers and sisters, once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Can I have a show of hands? Have you received mercy? Yes? Amen. Wonderful. Praise the Lord. Thank God. Church, since we have received mercy from God, you and I, all of us here, we are obligated to show mercy to others. I'm not sure this afternoon when you enter the church, you join us in worship, sing the hymns, any grievances against your fellow brothers and sisters right now. Jesus brings up this point again a few verses later in Matthew 6, verse 14 to 15. For if you forgive other people, when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Know that this is the only beatitudes where the express condition and the promised blessing are identical to each other which makes some of you wonder which one comes first? God's mercy for us or our mercy for others? Because he says, blessed are the merciful for they will be shown mercy. What makes, which, which one comes first? God's mercy for us or our mercy for others? Any answer? The Bible makes it clear that God's mercy always comes first. When we recognize our own need and our own sin before God, and when we realize how God has, merciful, has been merciful to us, brothers, sisters, we will be merciful with others as well. And so being a merciful, forgiving and loving or loving person is not a condition for God's grace. Being a merciful, I repeat, being a merciful, forgiving person is not a condition for God's grace. But it is a necessary consequence. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. This is a beautiful portrait of the disciple of Jesus Christ. If you, truly a believer and disciple of Christ. On the other hand, that also means someone who has no mercy for others has no obvious relationship with God. If someone is merciful at heart, they are ready for and without fear of God's judgment, knowing they have been mercy just as the Father does. God has promised us that he, we will receive mercy from Him if we are merciful to others. But whoever has no mercy for others, let's self-examine then you may have no obvious relationship with God. And so if we have received unlimited mercy from our loving God, if we have been lifted from our poor, sinful, wretched state 
to become citizens of heaven, how can we withhold mercy from others? Not just spiritual sense, but it also includes physical aspect, where we see Jesus, who is, and that is the only adjective described, the only adjective, merciful, used to describe him in the book of Hebrews. That's the only, the merciful, this word, in this adjective form, in this tense. It appears in Hebrew and it is used to describe Jesus. Jesus has demonstrated to us how he showed compassion to the people who are in need. So when we talk about mercy, being merciful, we also not forgetting, just pray for forgiveness for others, but then we do not show a physical care for them. Be, be merciful, brothers and sisters, just as your Father is merciful. Luke 6, 36. And next, Jesus talks about the blessing for the pure in heart. What does pure in heart mean? As modern Christians, we might associate purity today with a freedom from sexual sin or moral failure. For those who first heard Jesus' words, may have connected purity to performing the law of Moses or perfectly following the rules of the Jewish teachers. And that means this, this would carry the sense of being completely free from sin. However, Jesus, he focused much on the hearts of his listeners instead of their ability to maintain the riches of the law. He preached against obeying the law in action only rather than out of true love for God. And if you look up the definitions of purity, purity in its most clear and original meaning, it refers to the idea of something being singular, unified, unmixed, or consistent. The pure in heart are focused from the inside on one single thing. And in this case, that one thing is God and God alone. Jesus promised here that when the kingdom of heaven arrives, those who are pure in their devotion to God will see him. This reveals a remarkable idea about God's kingdom. Most Jews, they would have learned at an early age that nobody can see God and live. He is too holy. Jesus, he says here that those who enter into the kingdom of heaven will see God. Proverbs 20 9 says, Who can say, I have kept my heart pure, I am clean and without sin? Who can say that? Raise your hand. Can you say? I'm sure you can. The answer, and only answer to that, is that only God can make your heart pure. 
we don't change our own hearts. Only God can change your heart. Consider David's prayer in Psalms 51. Create in me a pure heart, O God. A pure heart. A pure heart is a new creation by God. Not something we can achieve on our own. And so how does God do it? How does God make our hearts pure? How does God make our hearts pure? To do this, someone had to die. To do this, someone had to die. I give you an illustration. Today, with the medical advances, we see heart transplant. You can read many stories of these people who went through heart transplant. Their old heart can function. They need a new heart. Meaning, someone has to give up. And with this new heart, for him, then can he live. Someone has to donate it. How does God make our hearts pure to do this? Someone had to die. You can go Google search. There are many stories, many survivors who went through heart transplant. And they are so appreciated, so thankful, so grateful to the donor. Because if without their sacrificial love or don these donors, they can't live. When you put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ, who died for you on the cross, God purifies your heart. You get a new heart from Jesus. Acts 15, verse 9 says, He purifies their hearts by faith. He forgives you of your sin. He removes your old heart of stone. Ezekiel 11, verse 9. And He gives you a new heart to follow Him. We thank God for giving us a new heart. You do still sin because your new heart is incarcerated within your old flesh. But your new heart continues to fight against your flesh. And that is why Paul said, For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law at work within me. Romans 7, verse 22, 23. Well, brothers, sisters, I want to encourage you with a new heart. As you persevere in battle with, against the world, against our flesh, and against the devil, be encouraged by reminding yourself that one day the fight will be finished. The Apostle John said it this way. 1 John 3, verse 2 to 3. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All who have this hope in him purifies themselves just as he is pure. Remember, earlier, be merciful as he is merciful. Here, purifies yourself just as he is pure. God not only forgives you for your sin, but he also washes you clean. He cleanses you within. He purifies your heart. Today, if you can't remember everything, 
all what I've said, remember your heart is a new heart that God has given to you through his son who died on the cross for you. And this heart, this new heart, will continue in battle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. But persevere. 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 And God will promise continue to wash, clean us, cleanse us. Amen? Next, we come to the peacemakers, verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. Jesus is plainly telling us here, we should all seek peace in every situation with the promise, we will be called sons of God. A few verses later in Matthew 5, verse 44 to 45, he explains how to do this. And then he repeats his promise. Look here. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Paul's letter to the Romans also emphasized the importance of peace. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, verse 18. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Romans 12, verse 18. Today, I would like to urge you, brothers and sisters, should you sit here, you still have any grievances, unforgiveness against your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, now he or she is worshipping at another church. May God give you the courage, help you to come before him, to ask for forgiveness, and also give you the strength to forgive whoever that have caused hurt, harm to you. Next Sunday is our Holy Communion. May we come, refresh, and once again experience the real joy in what God has promised for us. For we are all children of God. We thank God. We don't deserve it all, but it's God that lavishes His love on us so that we can be called children of God. Isn't it wonderful? Amen? We should do everything we can within our power to be at peace with others in our lives. You know what? As a pastor, sometimes if we were assigned to other church and get to know some members, acquaint and then learn how come you are transferred here, when, or maybe the members you haven't transferred, why was he here? Well, when you find out more or hear more, you know there were grievances between fellow brothers and sisters. This is unfortunate. This is sad. This shouldn't happen. And so we should do everything we can within our power to be at peace with others in our lives. Yes, it's not always possible to be at peace with someone. They have a say in it, too. But we should do all that we can. If I, if I have done wrong, then I need to apologize. If the other person has wronged me, then I need to forgive. I need to forgive. Again, Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Be merciful as he is mercy. Just as he is mercy. Be purify yourself just as he is pure. Forgive as he forgave you. The peace Jesus is talking about isn't just peace with others or the world. 
It is also about the peace we experience when we have a relationship with him. And so his peace in us allow us to extend it to others. And this is why why we pray or why we can pray for our enemies. We can bless them, bless those who cursed us, and do good even when nobody else is doing. The ultimate result is the fruition of who we truly are the sons and daughters of God. Another point here is purity and peace. Purity and peace goes together. We see this in other scriptures as well. James 3.17 says here, the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving. And then again in Hebrews 12, verse 14, make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Purity and peace always go together and we cannot separate them and still partake of Jesus' blessings. And so James 3, it shows us that when we, whenever we ask we find ourselves lack of wisdom. We ask for wisdom from God. First of all, pure. Pure. Then peace make, peace loving. Now, any illustration, any example that can show these two together? Remember Paul, while well, he was in prison, he wrote a letter to Philippians church. He said he is aware that some share the gospel. What is the gospel? What does the gospel mean? Share the gospel while having a selfish ambition. Sharing the gospel is sharing the good news, peace with God. Yet, we can still share the gospel while holding on to selfish ambition. Is this pure? No. Purity and peace always go together. There are three ways in where we, can, we are called to be peacemakers and we should work hard at making peace. One, with others. Between others and between others and God. All right? Why I didn't mention about myself or your own self. Yes, first of all, we know because of Jesus, we have this peace with God. And so, with that, we should work hard at making peace with others, between others and also between others and God. Sometimes your family members may ask you to help to settle some disputes among your family members. Or maybe in workplace. So we need to be committed peacemakers in every sphere of influence in our lives. At home, at work, at school, in the church, in the community, and in the world. This is peacemaker. Finally, we come to the eighth and the last Beatitudes. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Would you rather be cursed by men or be blessed by God? 
Dominic, <laughs> would you rather be cursed by men or be blessed by God? And guess what? You don't have to choose. According to this beatitude, the final beatitude here, you can have both. Jesus pronounced God's blessing on those who are persecuted by men. Those persecuted by men, if you look on, it can be insulted, right? Falsely accused or maybe cursed by men. But yet, you can experience blessing by God. But, please, for the right reason, persecution is not optional for the Christians who takes a stand for righteousness. And this is to be expected. As Paul warned us in 2 Timothy 3 verse 12, that whoever desires to live godly lives will suffer persecution. Whoever desires to live godly lives will suffer persecution. This is a good provision for our own self-examinations before God. These persecutions need not be physical, of course. Of, and more often than not, it means sufferings, discomfort, and making sacrifices. In our society, in our society today, Christians who take a stand for righteousness are accused, accused of being hateful and judgmental. We, can, we hear a lot and it, the social, on the social media. We also, we can, you can read a lot of stories. Some have been attacked publicly. Others have lost their jobs. But none of this should be surprising to us. Remember this. We are not asked to seek persecution. We are not asked to seek persecution, but to face it when it comes. And so, while the disciples were listening to Jesus from Beatitudes 1 to 8, they may be wondering, who are those people? Because Jesus has been saying, blessed are those, blessed are those. And now, Jesus, I think he should be looking at them and then say, blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Matthew 5, 11. Because of me. What does it mean? It means not just because of righteousness, but also because you choose to identify with Jesus Christ. Last time I used to hear, I think my, my, my generation, huh? we used to hear what like, holy men, holy men, or things like that. Huh? Yeso, gong yeso, things like that. Stuff like this. Sometimes you just feel very hurtful. But as Jesus said in John 15, verse 20, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. And indeed, if you read on, the first, the early church, it was because of Jesus that the apostles were persecuted. And we, we read in Acts 5.41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing because what? Because they had been counted worthy 
of suffering disgrace for the name. That is the name of Jesus. They were sent to jail, but they count it as a joy. They rejoice because they have been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. Again, this is prov- uh, uh, good provisions for us to do self-examine? Have I, com- have I compromised my faith? Because I want to be, I seek the approval of men. I want to identify with the people, so I compromise what is right before God. But here Jesus said, those who are persecuted for righteousness, those who are persecuted because of him, shall be blessed. So again, again, would you rather be cursed by men or blessed by God? And Jesus goes on in verse 12 to say, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The word translated here, be glad, literally means to leap for joy. To leap for joy. And so church, what should be your attitude when you face persecutions for your faith in Christ? Thank God, until today, you may be saying, oh, thank God, until today, nothing happened to me. So far, so good. Well, good. At the same time, I also urge you Yes, perhaps it's time for self-examination. During lunch, where a colleague queued up for Toto 4D, were you there with them? Pastor, because Jesus identified with us, I want to identify with them so that give me more chance to share gospel with them. Is that so? Somebody, someone here, I'm chill. I just want to, yeah. So, I'm chill, I'm chill. Hokkien, I'm chill. <laughs> it's not a new vocab. But I just want to remind you, right? Yeah. self examine Did I give myself excuses? What should be your attitude when you face persecutions for your faith in Christ? You shouldn't retaliate. You shouldn't ignore or deny it. Come before the Lord. And He will comfort you. He will show you. He will grant you, give you strength. And again, He told his disciples to rejoice. To rejoice. Because what? Great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Rejoice. Because counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. In 1 Peter says this. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a murderer. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. We thank God for his encouragement, his words. And so as we wrap up these sections of uh, scripture, let's review. 
What are the Beatitudes? What are the Beatitudes? They are Jesus' blessings upon his followers. Together, they describe what a follower of Jesus looks like. Earlier, I shared about the different writers describe the eight Beatitudes in different ways. They were helpful. And if you look at some, they will break it and show us the structure as such. And they will highlight the first and the final one, that is God's promise on kingdom of heaven, and also the fourth and the last on righteousness. 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 If you remember, last week I shared about the theme verse for this, the ser- I mean the previous week on introductions of Sermon on the Mount, the theme verse 520, the righteousness need to be above the Pharisees. Here is highlighted to us. Hunger and thirst for righteousness. And if you hunger for that, you live for that, you will you can expect what? Persecution. As the psalmist says, Psalms 23, verse 3, I read to you, He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for the sake of his name. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for the sake of his name. And Proverbs assure us in Proverbs 12, verse 18, ESV, in the path of righteousness is life. And in its pathway, there is no death, meaning eternal life. God provide, given us his son to be our righteousness so that we can stand right before him. We thank God. We don't deserve it. God is merciful. He didn't give us what we deserve. He didn't give us what it, we deserve. He is a holy God. We could have done. Because God is a just God. Yet, to cross, he demonstrated his life, his love for us. And this again proves his wisdom. And so all true Christians will display all these characteristics in the Beatitudes. Although not all Christians will display them equally. It is a battle between living for the kingdom of self, where you and I try to be kings and queens of our own life, and the kingdom of heaven, where Jesus, the risen Lord, is king. It is a battle between living for the kingdom of self and living for the kingdom of heaven. But remember, The heart in you is God's given. It's a new heart. You will continue to battle with the world, with your flesh, and with the devil. But, thank God, he has already promised us with all spiritual (coughs) needs, all spiritual blessing, and he has equipped He will equip us and continue to lead us just like Psalms 23, verse 3. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for the sake of his name. So, the more you display these qualities in your life, the happier you will be in Christ and the greater you will know these blessings 
that are reserved only for the followers of Jesus. If, you, if we strive to leave out the Beatitudes, we will be blessed. We will be blessed. Amen? Amen. So the question is, are you a child of God? If yes, your responsibility is to leave out what the Beatitudes has pronounced. The call of kingdom living is right now, is today, and every day for the rest of your life. Amen? Amen. May the Lord bless you.